Uh, I, I couldn't help but think of that old Dr. Pepper jingle when you said prepper, be a prepper, drink, drink Dr. Prepper is what I, where I went. So yeah, I'm ready to preach. Can you tell? All right. Maybe the hardest chapter in the Bible to preach, depending on who you ask. Why worship God for Armageddon? That's the title today. Why worship God for Armageddon? Anybody seen the movie Armageddon? Bruce, Bruce Willis, right? Is it any good? I haven't seen it. He saves the world, probably, right? So if he saves the world, he's either Jesus or it's not really Armageddon. But um, Armageddon, right, when we hear the word, we think end of the world. Well, in one sense, it actually is the end of the world as we know it. Another song. But, uh, but it's the beginning of the best is yet to come for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and, and in a sense, Armageddon should move us to worship God. Now, that sounds a little strange because a lot of people are going to die. But when we realize it and think about it from God's perspective, I think you'll see why God is worthy to be worshipped, not only for his love, his grace, and his mercy, but also for his justice because he's holy. And we wouldn't respect a judge who wasn't always judging with integrity. We, would, we expect that judge to judge with integrity, not ever once let somebody off just to let him off. That would be corrupt. And we would expect God to be perfect in his judgments. And he is, because he is holy, he is perfect, and he is unchanging in that perfection. And so that means that's one of the many attributes of God that he is worthy of our worship for. Now, we don't sing a lot of songs about the justice of God because we like mercy, because <laughs> we need it. But we probably should. We probably should sing songs about his justice. We certainly sing about his holiness, which is related. So... Um, why worship God for Armageddon is the question we're going to ask, today, answer, ask and answer today. God is glorified in his justice, even as he sends this awesome wrath on humanity, his enemies, who deserve it. And I'm going to show you why that's the case. Now, it's important that we look at chapter 16 through God's eyes instead of through ours. Because when, when you hear how God ends his trifecta of judgments, you're going to go, if you, tend to, if you look at it through your eyes, you and I are going to go, yeah, that's way over the top, that's way unnecessary, that's way more than they deserve. And when we say they, we mean the enemies of God, because certainly we're not going to, we don't want to experience that. But when you look at it through God's eyes, it, it seems not only appropriate, but absolutely necessary. So I want you to just kind of walk with me through this little thought process here. So God is love, and God creates because that's one of the things that love does. And so God said, I want to create the universe, and I want to create a world in that universe with people on it. And I want to give those people who are not in existence yet, I want to bring them into existence to live on that planet and to know me and be known by me personally. I want to have a relationship with them. I want to know them, and I want them to know me. But I, I, I can't make robots. I don't want to make them love me. So I want to give them a choice. So I'm going to create a great world. Call it the pleasure globe. I don't know. But anyway, they, this world where everything is beautiful, everything they need is provided for them, and I'm just going to give them the job to just be fruitful and multiply, which sounds awesome. I'll give them one rule, though. Um, don't don't eat the fruit from that one tree because there's millions of trees to choose from with a huge diversity of fruit. So you just, just don't eat from this one tree. Trust me in this. Okay? Trust me that this is good and wise because after all, I created you and I love you and I'm going to walk with you in the, in the, in the evening and we're going to talk face to face and you can ask me anything you want. Like, why don't we have belly buttons? Adam and Eve, right? Like, Oh, yeah, they wouldn't have. And then Adam says, what's a belly button? But anyway, so they're so asking God just whatever questions come to mind, like um, what's an owl and why does this one talk? Or, you know, just they can ask him anything. Can you imagine being so just with God and, and that there's just no barrier? There's no disrupt. It's just like just clarity. And you live in a world, and, it, and it's you and her, and you're going to start a family, and, and, the, and you're going to populate the world. 
and it's going to be glorious. And then someone else shows up and says, did God really say? And causes them to doubt the words of their creator. To doubt the words enough to actually disobey the one rule. And of course, the consequences immediately kick in because like the laws of physics, the laws, spiritual laws that God has created, they are unchanging. And so that happens. Now, what does God do in response to that? You would think, well, he could shut them down in a heartbeat. He could end this whole thing and wad it up, throw it in the trash can and start over if he wanted to. But he doesn't do that. What he does is an act of justice, but also an act of mercy. And God likes to do the two together. We like to say it's justice or mercy. He likes to make a way for both to be possible. And he does that is he removes them from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, puts a guard with a sword on fire at the gate. That does two things. One is it takes them out of Eden, but it also keeps them away from the tree of life. And if they were to eat from the tree of life, they would live forever in their eternal separation from God's state. Okay, which Jesus calls ultimately hell, okay, but eternally separated from God. God protects them from that so that they have a chance to repent and believe, so that they have a chance to be reconciled to him. So God's grace. What, how does humanity respond to that act of mercy and grace? We crucify him on a cross. And he yet he sent that son to die on the cross for our sins so that once again we could be reconciled to him by praying and asking for his forgiveness and believing that Jesus made that possible. And what do we do as a result of that? We live as if it doesn't matter. We live as if Jesus dying on the cross was no big deal and we just go on about our lives as if we're the one on the throne instead of him. So take that. And, and, and insert that into your story, make your part of that story, and imagine how many times a day you sin without a thought about the cross, without a thought about the consequences. That's more than you wanna know. Now let's think about how many times in a lifetime we do that, because you take that and multiply it times 365 days a year, times however many years you live, say 80. That's a lot of sin. Now take that and multiply it times 8 billion people on the planet about right now we're close to 8 billion. That's a lot. And then you've got to go in history and there's billions of people that have been and have gone. Same thing. And I'm not even talking about the ones ahead. And all of a sudden you can start to see from God's perspective why he might be more than a little bit ticked off about it. Because he's holy and he hates sin. And to be just, he must punish sin. Now, he punished the sins of the world on the cross when he punished Jesus. He poured out wrath there. But the consequences of our pushing him back and stiff-arming him and rebelling against God, well, there are consequences. And if we choose not to trust him and follow him, we will receive those consequences. All our lives, if you look through history and in our, in our lives and even before, you can see through history how God has used evil to judge evil. He doesn't create evil. evil. He's not the author of evil. He's not the source of evil. But he created a world so that we could choose to trust and follow him or not. So that we wouldn't be puppets, marionette puppets on strings. That we wouldn't be robots who have to love the Lord, oh God, because that is how I'm programmed. We don't have to do that. And so he, he's grieved over that. So when we read about these seven bowls, which are the last seven judgments of God. We had the first seven seals of God, starting in chapter six of Revelation, and then we had the seven trumpets, and now we have the seven bowls, and he's gonna finish, and he will be done judging the world forever. We're a day closer to that day happening than we were yesterday. That's God's providential will. That will happen, it's coming, it's appointed, it's ordained, it's just a matter of when. Okay, and it appears to be at the end of this seven years that Revelation talks about, whether it's a literal seven or a figurative seven, doesn't matter. At the end of that, the judgments will be done. And then there'll be the Bema Seat, which is the first judgment of God where he, um, where he actually judges his people. And then later comes the great white throne, which is where he judges and separates all. 
I may have that backwards, but I think that's right. So as we read through this, I want you to remember, we're looking at this to, to take away. God is glorified and worthy to be praised for his holy, divine justice and wrath, which is played out in many ways, and then Armageddon is part of that. It's not all of it, okay? So let's start reading through this. I just want to show you it. Now, what's going to happen here is as I read these seven bowls, okay, which is just a, a, a why a bowl, I, I'm not quite sure, but just picture the wine of God's wrath in a bowl, which if you were an alcoholic back in the days of Jesus, you didn't drink out of cups, you drank out of bowls, okay? It'd be kind of like taking the keg and tipping it your way, you know? It'd be like you had these bowls of wine. That's how they would the rich or, the, or the, the, um, the wicked would drink that way. So they have these bowls full of God's wrath and it's just a shallow bowl that they would just sling over whatever it is they were pouring them over and that's what would receive the, the plague, if you will. So with that, let's jump in and let me show you where I'm getting all of this. Starting in verse one, I'm just gonna read through the chapter and I'm gonna make it, as I, as I get to a bowl, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna read to you, it's gonna tell you the place, it's gonna tell you the punishment or the plague, and then in some cases, it's gonna tell you a promise or a perversion. Okay, so in the first three, you're also gonna see the response of the righteous, and in the last four, you're gonna see the response of the wicked. And just note the contrast, and that's gonna give us the reasons why Pray, why do we praise God for Armageddon? Why do we praise God for his justice? For those two reasons, th those responses will tell us, and I'll, I'll explain that when we get to it. So verse one, now remember John is writing this down. It's a vision. For those of you that haven't been with us for this series of Revelation, Revelation is, a, the, is called the Revelation or the Apocalypse, okay? Both of those words meaning the unveiling, the revealing of what is coming, the future, uh, future, it's, it includes past history, but it also includes future history, okay? And apocalypse, we tend to use like Armageddon, but they do not mean the same thing. Apocalypse means unveiling. Armageddon, while we don't know exactly the meaning of the word, because we don't even know how to spell the word, it basically refers to the final battle between good and evil, between God and Satan and his kingdom of darkness, okay? Now, well, that's kind of it. John is writing it down as he gets this vision, as he is on the penal colony on the island of Patmos under the emperor, under um, Roman Empire rule. Then I, John writes, then I heard a loud voice from the temple, not temple on earth, there's the temple in heaven, okay? okay? The temple on earth has probably been destroyed. So this is the heavenly temple that is pointed out in chapters four and five. I heard a loud voice from that temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. So there are the general instructions. Go, okay, from the throne or from the temple. We assume from God himself, but it's certainly under his authority. Angel number one. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. And ugly, festering sores broke out on all the people or on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped its image. Okay, these are people who've already rebelled against God so far, so much, they're so afraid they, they've received this mark of the beast, okay, that it's referred to earlier. Whether it's a literal 666 branding or whether it's something else isn't what's important. What's important is our allegiance. We all choose who we're gonna worship because we're created to worship. It's wired in our DNA. We all worship somebody or something, okay? Anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ gets us into this category, okay? Because Jesus is the creator, Jesus is the sustainer, he is the redeemer, it's all about him. And that's why when we go back to chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, and this is kind of the, the precipice of the mountain that is Revelation, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord God and the Messiah and he shall reign forever and ever, the Messiah being Jesus, okay? So, first angel, string sores, broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. I don't know if you've ever had a, 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 a well, even just a canker sore in your, in your, in your mouth or a, a, a boil or a, a, any kind of painful sore. You just, like, it's just, they're painful. Now imagine all over your body and you can't do anything about it. That's first one. That's the first plague, the first one. Second one, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. 
the oceans. Okay, and it turned into blood, but not just normal blood. Look how it's described. Blood like that of a dead person. What would that be like? It'd be coagulated, right? It'd be kind of gooey, smelly, not something you would want to put back in anybody's body. Okay, blood like that of a dead person and every living thing in this. So now we've, we've got everybody on land is suffering from sores and everybody, everything in the ocean is dead because of this gross blood. Third angel, third bowl. Third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. Okay, so now drinking water is a problem. Okay, now remember at this point we've already seen over half the world's population has been decimated. So we're down to less than four, million, four billion people on the planet. If the church has already been raptured, either mid or pre-trib, which you know some people believe that, I'm I'm good with that. Um, they're all gone, which could be you know by the most optimistic numbers, that's three billion. Realistically, it's probably more like a billion or less. Um, so the only people left are st the, most of those fake folks are in the category of I've already taken the mark of the beast, or I haven't decided yet. And then there's probably a few that have come to know the Lord in, since then, so you have a few Christians that are around. So the third angel then says something. Now this is why, this is one of the reasons why we worship God for something like Armageddon. The angel, then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are speaking to the Lord. You are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were, Here's why. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Flip back to chapter 6, and I'll just show you where this is. We won't spend much time. Verses 9 and 10. If you'll remember, when we went through the seals, we just starting the seal, and this is in the fifth seal, okay? It says, I'm sorry, I'm going to start reading in verse 9. Sorry, guys, in the back, I didn't tell you about this. When, we, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, and this is the altar in heaven, okay, this is the altar. I saw, so John says, when, I op when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain, that is killed, because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. These are people, Christian martyrs, people who died because of their Christian testimony. That's who they are. And in heaven, that group is figuratively, literally, you know, under this altar in heaven. And this is what they say. Verse 10. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And I would say, well, just hang in there until chapter 16, because that's when it comes, which I don't know when that is. I know it's in the future. I don't know how far. But they're like, you know, avenge our blood because we don't, we're not going to take vengeance. Vengeance is of the Lord, but Lord will take vengeance. It's his job. It's his prerogative as the Holy One. Okay? And so they, they call him holy, and they say, your judgments are just. Now, this is the opinion of an angel. You might say that's just one angel. That's just one angel's opinion, which to me carries a lot of weight. I mean, after all, they're holy. They're in the presence of God. That's way better than where I am. Okay? But then we hear this in verse 7. And I heard the altar respond. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen an altar talk, so this is literally personification, okay, giving human attributes to an inanimate object. And heard the altar, so probably those around the altar, which would have been um, the four creatures, the 24 elders, the myriads of angels, and, oh, underneath the altar, those we just read about in chapter 6. What do they say? Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard that, we had, that justice had been done as far as Osama bin Laden, I was not sad for him in the sense that justice had been done. Obviously, I'm sad that his, that his soul is where he is because of that, unless he repented and believed late in life, which there's no indications that that's the case. But I wanted justice for the one who made it so that those people died in the towers and that collapse, okay? Justice for someone like Adolf Hitler, something I would want. And to have a God in heaven who doesn't bring justice to people who do some of those kinds of things would be a crime in my book. And so I 
I am grateful that we have a God who believes and, and it, who is just because he is holy in, his, in the way he carries himself. That he doesn't practice inconsistent or unfair judgments, okay? Heaven is testifying that his judgments are good. From God's perspective, these judgments, as horrific as they sound, are actually appropriate which should tell us how wretched and wicked it is to reject your creator, okay? And yet all of us know people who don't know the Lord. And they don't realize this because they don't believe this. And our job is to lovingly point them to the truth as if they were walking towards a cliff that they don't see and if we don't say something, they're going to walk right off the cliff and die. We're, our job is to rescue them by telling them the truth. We can't make the decision for them. We're not, our job isn't to twist their arm and smack them over the head with the Bible. Our job is to lovingly demonstrate it and tell them about it. That means we live it, but it means we open our mouths. Okay, and we're motivated by love. Now that's part of the answer to the question, why worship God for Armageddon? It's because he will carry out justice where it's appropriate, where it's deserved. These, uh, some of these wicked folks are folks who killed people simply because they believe Jesus is the Messiah. You realize that in the 20th century, more Christians died for their faith than in the previous 19 centuries combined. So we read about, you know, Christians being fed to the lions and, and uh, in, in the days of Rome, but it's only gotten worse. And the 21st century isn't any better. People dying because they believe in Jesus, because they won't say no. Think of 1999 in America. Cassie Bernal in Columbine High School, and Eric Dillon's got a gun pointed at her face, and he says, do you believe in God? And she says yes, and he pulls the trigger. She was faithful. She, was, she became a Christian martyr. She was a witness of her life. Okay? And the question that I have for me and you is, would, would we say yes? Would we truly stand firm in the face of that because we believe the best is yet to come? Or are we so afraid of losing this life because we don't really believe in the next that we would compromise? We don't know. But the hint of what you would do in that split second is seen in how you live the life. If you live a life where the pattern of your life is I want to be faithful and I'm going to walk in, in consistency with God, then you're probably going to say the right thing at the right time or you're going to probably be faithful to the end. And if your pattern of your life is inconsistency, then it's a roll of the dice. And if your pattern is not to follow the Lord in the life, then why would you follow him in death? You've got your answer. So there's some, think about that. Think about where you are. Think about how you think about these kinds of things. It's sobering which is why this is such a hard chapter. Verse eight is the fourth angel. Now, the response to the first three, we saw the response of the righteous, and that is, you are holy and just in, in all your ways, God. Now, let's see how the, the wicked respond to these judgments, and let's see what the next four are. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. I don't think copper tone's gonna help you here. This is some serious sun power, and it says they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God and had control, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. So there's the response of the wicked, round one. Even though God wants them to, to be mo sobered, okay, I'm your creator and I'm sending these judgments because I want you to repent and believe and trust me because I want to rescue you, but yet I'm not going to force myself on you and they choose to rebel, and they choose to continue to rebel and, re and just say, no, I refuse to repent. You and I know people like that, but that doesn't mean that that can't change. Let's not believe there's no hope. As long as there's blood pumping through their veins, or is it arteries, or both, that, right? that there's a, there's a hope. There's hope that they can come to know the Lord. God is all the way up to the last wrath, continuing to invite them to turn to him because he wants no one to perish, but he will allow you to choose to not be with him forever, okay? Jesus talked a lot about hell, more than heaven, 
And it's because he understood that hell is a real thing that we must weigh in the balance when we think about life, death, and, and, the, etern and the afterlife, the etern eternity. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now we're getting right to the epicenter of all this evil, right? Okay, so remember there's the dragon, the beast, and the second beast, which is also called the false prophet. The dragon is Satan. The first beast or the beast from the land is the Antichrist, not an Antichrist, but the Antichrist in the seven years. And then the false prophet, the second beast is the false prophet. The Antichrist is the one who creates the one world religion. The, the false prophet is the one who creates the one world, I'm sorry, one world government, Antichrist, one world religion, false prophet, and all inspired by Satan and his his, uh, as he's the one inspiring that in them and using them and manipulating them to that. We call that the unholy trinity and you're gonna see what they do here in a minute to influence the leaders of our world. Look at how, uh, what happens. Uh, he pours the bowl on the throne of the beast, which by the way, we don't know exactly where it is. Um, it could have been at, at this, it could be at Babylon, which um, it could be symbolic. It could also be in Pergamum, which in early chapter of, of Revelation, that's where Satan lived, God says. He lives in your city. Can you imagine being a church and Satan lives in your city? You see, Satan doesn't live everywhere because Satan is not a god. He is an angel. He's a fallen angel, which is what we call demons. He's just a special one, um, okay? Because when he led a third of the angels to rebel in heaven, God cast them out for their rebellion. Those, what we know as demons are fallen angels, Okay? They are real, just as real as angels are. We just can't see them because they live in a dimension that we're not able to see into yet. Okay? I think we will one day. On the other side, we'll get to see. We'll, it'll be amazing what we're going to get to see. But that's, they have influence in our world and power in our world, and that's why there's evil in our world because they're the ones stirring it up and wreaking havoc. That's part of that. Okay? Throne of the beast, its kingdom was plunged into darkness. Okay, this, this, like several of these, refer back to or remind us of the plagues in Egypt when Moses was there saying, let my people go to Pharaoh, and God was sending the plagues because Pharaoh kept saying no, no. And one of those was that he made things dark for Egypt. What was interesting is that God made the plague so that only the Egyptians were in total darkness. Okay, it means you, you can try to light a match or candle, it's not gonna happen, it's pitch dark. But Israel was still in the normal cycle of day and night. They were unaffected. And I think that's the case for um, those who are here. They're going to experience the darkness. Now, I don't know this, but there's a good chance that those Christians that are still here are not going to suffer from the wrath of this. Because God tells us that we won't in 1 Thessalonians 5. But it doesn't mean they're not affected by it, but they're not going to reap the, the wrath. Okay? So if you have great-great-grandchildren or if you and I are still here when this all goes down and it goes dark for them for three days, or not three days, that was the Exodus version, there's no end to this darkness for them. And we're like, oh, it looks good to me. Maybe this is what it is. This is how they responded. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, they're still covered with sores, they're still seared from the sun, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The, imp the implication here is they get out of this and they're not doing it. That's pride. That's, that's why people don't trust and follow God. Pride. I know better or I want to be in charge. And, and that's just, that's hard it's hard to help somebody see because pride blinds. The sixth angel, verse 12, poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, if you go today to, I don't know if it's in Iraq or Iran, I think it's in Iraq, the river Euphrates, maybe it's on the border. It's a massive river there. He's gonna dry it up. Now, it's interesting. God is drying the river up. That's one of the bowls. It seems odd, like an odd plague. It doesn't seem to hurt anybody. What it does is it opens the way for these armies that are going to come from the east. Okay, so what's east of, of there is Iran, India, Pakistan, China, who knows? But they're coming from the east, and he simply makes it easier for them to come. It's almost like he's inviting them to come attack his people. 
Um, and, and, and in fact, that's what God is doing. Armageddon is on the horizon. And God knows it's going to be a very short war. But it's going to be devastating. Now, who's going to motivate those leaders to put those troops over there? Verse 13. I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. Why frogs? I don't know. But in the Old Testament, they're considered unclean. Um, and my mom always told me, don't pick them up. So they must be unclean. And they came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, which is probably another way of saying they're speaking with these impure spirits are speaking into the ears of these leaders. They are demonic spirits, those three. Okay, we've already talked about that. So, and, and it says that as demonic spirits, they perform signs. They have power. Evil power is real, okay? It comes through Satan and his legions, his hordes of demons, okay? And that is not the reason for all the evil in our world. It's part of the reason, okay? There's three, really three sources of evil, of temp, evil temptation. Satan and his legions, our, human, our flesh, our humanness, our carnal nature, which is the sinful nature that we're born into the world with, and then the worldly philosophies. The, the philosophies of this world are also influenced. And those are the three ways. And so trying to resist temptation and evil, those are the three categories that it comes at us um, in. All right, so then he says, um, that they, the demonics, they perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world, here is where they're doing it, to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. The great day of sometimes of the Lord, the day of the Lord, it's the day of judgment, it's Armageddon. And I'm just gonna skip 15 for a second. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon or Armageddon, okay? Um, I could tell you all the speculations about what that means and where that's it, where that's it is, I think, at the end of the day, it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening near wherever God's people are, and they're not going to have to lift a thumb to fight the battle, even though they'll probably be ready to do it. They'll probably be a little disappointed even. Okay, verse 15. Now, this is, um, in my Bible, it's printed in red, okay? The original scriptures are not printed in red and black. They're just black or whatever color ink they had on hand. Uh, but this means, if you have a red letter Bible, it means that the, the translators believe that there's a high likelihood that this is spoken by Jesus, okay? Just remember, that's like these headings on your chapters. That's not scripture. That's something an editor added. Um, so just keep that in mind. But it appears from context that when it says, look, I come like a thief, blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed, is the words from Jesus, okay? And um, the reason we say that is because Jesus has come and he said, I'm coming again, okay? We have the first coming of Christ, the first advent. We celebrate Christmas at the birth of the, of the Savior, okay? And then we read the New Testament and we see he says, I'm coming again. And that's the second coming or the second advent. And he's not coming as a baby the second time, okay? He's coming as a conquering king for this battle, Okay, yeah, that's why we don't have to worry about who wins. We know, okay? I don't know what the odds are in Vegas, but I know what the odds are in my mind. And, you know, I don't think you'll be around to collect, but so maybe not worry about the bet. But he says, I come like a thief. And if I had time, I would take you to 1 Thessalonians. So your homework is to go look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, first 11 verses. And it talks and expands on this idea of sleep and being awake and thief. And what is it? But bottom line, you know, when you think of a thief, how does a thief come? They come in the dark because they don't want to be seen. They come stealthy. So when they do show up, if you happen to see them, it's sudden to you because they've been trying to sneak up. Okay. And Jesus says, I'm going to come suddenly. And, you're, and most people are going to be asleep spiritually. They're not going to be ready for him. And he's, so that's why he says, stay awake. And in other places in Scripture we say, wake up, stay awake, be alert, watch out. All these are words that Jesus used and other people in Scripture use in the New Testament to say, spiritually, you need to be awake so that you won't be surprised when he shows up because you will have already trusted in him and you're walking in his ways. And so not only will you not be surprised, but you'll be ready and you'll actually be excited about it. You'll be glad he's showing up because things will probably be pretty bad by then as if they weren't now, okay? This is a beatitude also. You know how in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who mourn, da 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 through the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? 
there's 12 of those in the book of Revelation. This is the third. So blessed is the one, the person, who stays awake, a spiritual awake, and remains clothed. This sounds strange, right? Uh, remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Yeah, we, wanna, we are all dressed. We're all, for, fortunately, we're all in order here. Thank you very much for being clothed when you came. This is talking about imagery. And if we were to go back and take the time to look at Laodicea in chapter 3, you would see that one of the descriptions that Jesus uses to describe the people in the church in Laodicea is blind and uh, other things, but also naked. And what he's talking about here is they're not wearing their robes of righteousness, I think. They're not clothed in Christ. Okay? So, remember Adam and Eve in the garden? When they ate of the fruit, what happened? They felt shame. Why? They realized they were naked and they, right? They looked, where are the fig leaves and where's the gap? I need something to cover up with. Because they felt shame because they now had the knowledge of, the, of good and evil, which they didn't have before that God had not given them because... They didn't need it, okay? We're clothed in righteousness, so when we stand before our creator one day, we're not naked because we would be ashamed because of our sin, okay? Now, why aren't we ashamed of our sin? We still committed it. Why are we, not, why are we gonna be able to stand before God and not be ashamed? Because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the robes of Christ. What does that mean? It means that when God sees my sin, he doesn't see my sin because Christ already died for it. He sees Christ. And so he sees me as if I didn't sin, even though I sinned. That's what justification is. Even though I sinned, it's as if I haven't sinned because the blood of Christ has paid the penalty for my sin. So it's as if I never did. This is, this is good news. You can be excited about this. This is okay. This is, yes, this is clap worthy. This is praise worthy. This is shouted out because this is why you and I don't have to fear death. It's why we don't have to be afraid to die, okay? We might not really want to go through the process of dying and suffering and all that. I get that. But the whole idea of being and being in the presence of the Lord should not terrify us. It should exhilarate us. And if it terrifies you, that's a hint that you're, that you're in a category where you don't believe that that's the best is yet to come. And if you don't believe that, that means you don't trust Jesus. And now, that may not be actually absolutely true for every single person, but that should be a huge warning flag. If you are, are terrified of dying, the, not the process, but being gone because you don't know what awaits, it means you probably don't believe what awaits because you don't know. And so what, when, when we don't know the future, that makes us anxious. Trust him. Verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne. So this isn't just from the temple. This is from the throne. And if I remember right in 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5, God throne, Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain but is upright and alive, which pictures the cross and the resurrection, are both ones in the throne, ones at the right hand of the throne. So I don't know if it means one, both. I'm going to go with God the Father since he's sitting. He says in a loud voice, so it's authoritative from God himself from the throne saying it's done now where have we heard that before the cross john 19 30 it is finished jesus said when he dies right before he gives his last breath he says it's done i'm done i've done what i came to do i showed them the way and the truth and the life and then i gave mine what a summary of the christian life to show the people you care about the most and the strangers who are where you live, work, and play, how you show them the way, the truth, and the life, and then to be willing to give your life to do whatever it takes until God takes you home for his glory. That's, that's why we're here. That's why he hasn't already taken us home. So he continues and he says, it's done, verse 18, then there came, now this is a description of cosmic, cataclysmic, just chaos reigning in this last bowl. The, this is the storm of the last bit of the fury of God's full holy wrath. Okay? And every time we've seen something evil happen in our world, that's just a taste of God's holy wrath. Okay? I'm not saying that every single thing that happens in our world is God going, you know, 
throwing lightning bolts at it. He allows it because that's the way he's wired things to work. But these are intentional, sovereign decisions and proclamations and commands that he's making. We see these are coming from the throne. God is taking full credit for this judgment. Why? Because again, he's worthy to be worshiped because he's holy and he is giving people what they deserve. Simply that, which tells you how horrific it is. It's done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city, I think Babylon, split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. And I just want to keep reading, and then I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. The cities of the nations collapsed. It doesn't say all, but it doesn't make any exceptions either. The cities of the world. You know, we've heard, you know, he, Gene referred to Lisbon as being a city that had collapsed because of an earthquake. This is every city. That's the earthquake. That's the scope. It's, it's just not even in the same ballpark from what we've experienced or seen or heard of. God is going to shake the whole world in such a way, undeniable, who's in charge. Okay, and the only ones that aren't freaking out are those who are in Christ. Although I might be freaking out. I don't know. I'm hoping I'm not here, but you never know. Okay? But to know that that means the end is nigh, that it is, I'm about to see my Redeemer, come, come, Lord, quickly. God, re okay, so the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. I mean, it's so straightforward, right? It's, it's just, there it is. Verse 20, every, this is even more dramatic. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. We're talking about the change in our geomorphology and our topography. Mountains are sinking and islands are disappearing. It's just the whole earth. It's kind of the scale of, Y'all ever remember in, I don't know if it was in geography, uh, when we would study Pangea, when they, they theorized that the whole, all the land masses at one point were all squished together, and that when something caused them to all, maybe like a worldwide flood, just throwing that in there, but, um, you know, and so that scale, okay? Verse 21, from the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, not two pounds, fell on people. It made me think of the time, you know, and if you read um, in the days of Jesus when they would execute somebody, they would stone them, which means they didn't give them a joint and say, you know, go stand in a corner. They threw rocks. And, and they didn't throw these little tiny rocks. They threw big rocks like the biggest rock they could pick up and they would throw rocks at somebody until they died. Sometimes they would push them off a cliff and then throw the rocks. Sometimes they'd just start throwing rocks, put them, pick, pin them in a corner or, or, and, they, that was, and it was your peers doing it. So it was, it was grievous, not to mention painful. Now, 100 pound chunks of ice falling from the sky, raining down, no, and this is how they responded. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. I can understand them being upset except the fact that if they knew they could repent and believe, they could avoid it. The pride of the human heart is potent. And the only way to have, to find peace in Christ is to humble yourself and to seek him and to say, I need you because you're holy and I'm not. And so I need you to make it so that I can come to you. Because I, and, and God says, you don't have to come to me. I'm come, I've already come to you in the form of Jesus. You just trust me and I'll take care of the rest. And that's why we can say the best is yet to come because this isn't the end. Armageddon isn't the end of my life. It's the beginning of life 
in Christ without suffering and sin and death and shame and all the other garbage that we have in our world because there are consequences of sin. That's why it's called good news. Trust Christ. Have you done that? Have you trusted Christ? Why worship God for Armageddon? For for the righteous justice that is deserved and for our sanctification. Think about the Christians that are there during this time. Do you think that might help your prayer life a little bit? You think it might cause you to get more um, appropriately engaged with the Lord? That's called sanctification. That's the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. So these judgments have a refining process on his followers, those who are still there, and it is justice for those who are not, with an attempt to move them to repent and believe and not have to be receiving that. This is hard, but it's the Bible. And the Bible says about itself in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay, so that's why I believe it's good and I believe it's trustworthy. And it's why I'm sharing this terrifying news with you because I believe there are people in this room and I believe there are people on, that, on the other side of that screen that don't know the Lord and needed to hear this today. So let me pray for you. Lord God, as as I think about this sobering passage of Scripture that talks about the future history that's coming, I'm grateful that you saved me. I didn't deserve it. There's nothing I've done to earn that. And as soon as I think there is, I'm in trouble. No, it was by your grace that I was able to humble myself and come to you and say, I need you. And most of us in this room can say something along those lines. But there are those that are here today and watching online that know that's not true for them. Right now, they feel your, 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 your drawing. They feel conviction for their sin, but they feel your drawing. Your desire for them is life abundant and eternal. But Lord, you're not going to force them. And we're not going to try to talk them into it. We're going to pray that your spirit would make it possible for them to overcome the pride and to humbly approach their creator on his terms. And to believe that that's the way to true life. Just as Jesus said. And so, Lord, I pray um, for those who don't know you that they would come to know you. Lord, for those who know you and that are in this place, may we be sobered by this and recognize that people we know, lots of people we know, this is their future unless we get busy humbly sharing the truth of what's coming. You're coming like a thief, and it's going to surprise most of the world It's going to be sudden. And they're spiritually asleep unless we give them the grace of God and show them how they give us a heart of compassion for other people that goes beyond the surface to the heart matter, matter of the heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.